so it's good to be back, folks, uh, from two weeks ago. Um, I am not a doctor or a nurse or a, a social worker or a neuropsychologist. I'm a special ed teacher by training who has spent many years with all kinds of, uh, in all kinds of settings uh, with folks living with HD. So the only thing I like to say that I bring to the table is that I've walked, my fa family's not directly touched by HD, but I've walked beside many, many, many folks as they've uh, walked their HD road and uh, alongside their families who love them obviously very much. So uh, that's all my experience is. Uh, and I've been a friend of the HDA for a long time. And I dare say I know many of you and my uh, trips and all the opportunities they've given me all over England and Wales um, have given me a lot of friendships, created a lot of friendships for me that when, even though we've only met one another once or twice, uh, they they continue online, and I'm grateful for those always. So last two weeks ago, we did hurry up and wait was the name of the topic, and it hurry up and wait basically is trying to get those of us without HD to understand what it might feel like to think with HD, not the psychological things like fear and loss. Um, but just those kind of visceral feelings of fighting off confusion as you face your challenges so that we can better understand uh, the people that we care for as we walk alongside them on their HD road. As well as you know them, it's hard to see inside their head and what they feel as they think. We can see those through the exercise we did. We can recognize some of those visceral feelings in ourselves although HD magnifies them. But probably the, the biggest theme to me is the irony of the only things we can do to accommodate those cognitive challenges, like weight, one thing at a time, all the list of things you see in brochures, how simple those things are. But the profound irony is how difficult they are to do. So when somebody tells you to slow down or wait in the culture we live in, where everybody is multitasking, it's really, really hard to do. And that irony is just one more horrible thing about, it, about HD. So today I wanted to take those things we covered and apply them to folks who are in the most advanced years of their HD road and really apply them for and with carers. You guys call them carers, we call you folks caregivers. So I'll try to be consistent, carers. Try to apply them for carers because HD gets more and more difficult to apply some of these accommodations of cognitive uh, challenges as people get more and more physically disabled face that ongoing disability, progressive disability, added to all the cognitive uh, challenges they face. And they face far more cognitive challenges than just the list of things that we covered and we'll talk about today again. And then add on to it apathy in terms of mood. If people have an apathetic manifestation of HD where they are disinterested in almost everything and have lost interest in what things they were passionate about in the past. All of that stuff, it's really, really difficult to do. Um, as difficult as it is, there's always hope. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I think it's important to shine a light a little bit more in talking about that stuff. There's so much to talk about Huntington's disease and how it affects people, the, the worldwide family, all the topics that we can talk about. This one often gets short shrift and sometimes put in the back burner. So I wanna talk about that today. A lot of times in the most advanced stages and trying to keep people you love engaged, we're pretty much on our own. There's not a lot of research about it on which we can build it. We can take some of the earlier research and kind of project it or just 
put it in our tool belt and try to apply it. But a lot of times we're, you as carers, <coughs> excuse me, folks, we're on our own and we're limited on a positive note, we're only limited by how clever we can be. But I wanna show you that based on the experiences of other carers, some long gone now, uh, that endearing moments between people, no matter what the relationship is in the family, those endearing moments can endure all that HD throws our way uh, in terms of challenges. So the title of this talk, and uh, I'm not the most fluent Zoomer here, but uh, I wanna share my screen right now. And the title of this talk is Terms, whoops, let me get this straight here is terms of endearment. In other words, endearment meaning those poignant moments, those intimate private moments that you share with the one you love, um, how can we keep them going? So it's called terms of endearment. And I would try to fix that again, okay. Um, like to just begin by saying, I don't think of it really as terms of endearment in my head. I think of it as a love story. That what I'm about to tell you is a love story uh, among people. Again, could be any relationship within a family, not just spouses or partners, between siblings, between a parent and a child, between a uh, parent and child if, it's, if one has juvenile Huntington's disease or uh, between a child and a parent or siblings, whatever. Those moments, that love that's between you all. I'm gonna cite some people and steal some of their stuff, uh, some scenes from their uh, roads as they cared for people uh, in the more advanced stages and kept those poignant moments going. Um, but their story is not unlike yours. And I know that some of you listening have already had these things. I know some are working on keeping them going now. Um, so they're not unlike you. The people that were in their care, their relatives uh, faced all the, uh, may be different manifestations. There's a lot of manifestations of, you, of HD as you know, but they're not unsimilar from what you're faced. As I go through this, I just may be repeating myself here, but for emphasis, I want you to understand that I know how difficult it is, that there are all kinds of uh, challenges. There are all degrees of cognitive challenges. Early on, it's, it's uh, mild and disorienting compared to how it multiplies itself, but they get really difficult. The physical challenges, whether it's swallowing or dystonia, or Korea, but in the later years, Korea is less of a challenge pretty much for the folks that we're talking about. But all of those challenges, and again, as I said before, when you add the mood stuff, uh, like apathy, it's really, really difficult uh, to keep people engaged. And I'm betting that there are some of you who may be, I don't know how many folks are out there, but if there's a significant number, some of you may be facing these things now, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a minute, but it just seems so difficult that you can't keep people, that you can't keep the one you love connected. I just wanna, as you listen to this and feel like, geez, it's, I can't, this isn't relevant to me. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. I just wanna say, that one thing we can learn from people who've walked this road before is as difficult as it seem now, may seem now, and as, as overwhelming as it is to try and keep people engaged, even farther along, there may be windows of opportunity or where people can be reached more easily than you are doing it now for whatever reason. So it's not always a bleak picture. Uh, I just want to point that out. 
So I want to begin the story. Uh, I want to begin with this love story. First, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, two couples. Uh, the first being Len and Bobby, and the second one being Ben and Rosemary. So let me uh, switch my screen here. And we're going to talk about Len and Bobby. And Len and Bobby have four adult children, had four adult children. They lived in a small town, a very rural part of the US uh, in upstate New York. Uh, Bobby was well along her HD road. She had HD for probably about 20 years when this happened. Uh, she had great difficulty walking, um, but did a couple of times in the course of a day, but spent most of her time in a seating system or a wheelchair. She also had difficulty speaking clearly, so she didn't speak much at all, didn't speak often throughout the day. She lived in a nursing home where her husband, Len, would visit her daily. Small rural town, one nursing home, and it allowed him who worked nearby, had a sh lived nearby and had a shop nearby to visit daily, and I mean daily. So I wanna just share with you a snippet of some of Len's words that he wrote. Now I know in terms of giving a presentation, one of the, uh, the faux pas is to read things, uh, but I'm gonna indulge myself here because I wanna use Len's words himself and he wrote them and uh, they're instructive. So here's a snippet of Len's words. It's about his snuggling with his wife in her nursing home, his wife, Bobby. Len wrote, I bet you're wondering what this is gonna be about. Well, she always liked to snuggle up to me. And one evening, a while ago, while I was visiting her in the nursing home, I looked at her lying in her hospital type bed. I had given her something to drink and massaged her neck, face, arms, hands, and back. She really seemed comfortable. I got this feeling of wanting to be close to her. So I laid down next to her with only one cheek on the bed and my other foot on the floor to hold myself from falling. Hospital beds aren't very wide. She put her head on my shoulder and we stayed that way for a long time. I just started talking about some of the memories of our years raising the kids and stuff. It's become a part of my visits now and we both enjoy it so much. It was very relaxing mentally and I can tell by her size that it has the same effect on her. So, excuse me, an alarm I forgot to turn off. So listening to Len tell his story when, when I knew him, a couple of things stood out. First of all, when he talked about massaging Bobby and it was with that white hospital lotion, at least we have it in the US, I'm betting it's an international thing. It's kind of unique to hospitals. <clears throat> he talked about doing it. He massaged her neck and her shoulders and her feet and her calves. She had serious contractures in her legs, uh, but he always did it in exactly the same order. And as he told the story, he would say, and I would tell her I massage your feet, and now we do your calves. So he was always talking about what he was doing while he was doing it. He also uh, made great, paid great detail to getting her in the right position, posturally, the right position. Maybe it was just so he could fit one cheek on the bed and get the other foot on the floor, but he paid attention to her position. He also, as I kind of hinted at, he spoke slowly. Len by nature spoke slowly. It took forever for him to tell me the story. He'd also end the visits in the same order again by tucking uh, Bobby in, giving her a kiss on the cheek, saying good night, I'll see you tomorrow. There was that sameness uh, with attention to those particular details that he always included. <coughs> I'm sorry, again, as he would tell the story. So that's Ben, I'm sorry, Len and Bobby's 
let me share my screen again and tell you the story of Ben and Rosemary. There's a reason that heart-shaped pizza is there. You'll see in a minute. So Rosemary, like Bobby, she was well along her HD road. She might have had, I'm guessing, uh, HD symptoms for, I don't know, 12, 15 years. And she and Ben had three adult children. She too, like Bobby, had difficulty walking. Although Rosemary could walk, she would use a walker and a wheelchair, both throughout the day. And sometimes if it was short distances between chairs or between chair and bed or chair and a table talk, she with assistance would, would walk by herself. She too had difficulty speaking because of dysarthria, but she spoke often and people learned to understand her around her. It was difficult to understand her, but you learned it and she spoke often. And like Bobby, she lived in a nursing home where, like Len, Ben visited daily. Not every day, but very, very often. So now I wanna share a snippet of Ben's words that he wrote. And it was on the occasion of he and of his and Rosemary's 26th wedding anniversary. Ben wrote this. Today, my wife and I celebrate our 26th wedding anniversary. I took some time off work and went to her nursing home to take her to lunch. We passed a pizza parlor and she said, pizza. So pizza it was followed, or should I say overlaid by ice cream. As we were having our pizza, she kept saying, I love pizza. Normally she says only one word, sometimes two. To string three words together is a real achievement at this point. In the midst of keeping her from burning herself on piping hot pizza, then keeping her from choking on the gooey stuff, she paused and clearly said, I love you. It's easy to dream of a special meal served at a fine restaurant on beautiful China with the best service, but nothing will ever compare to the backseat of our Dodge today, covered in pizza and ice cream, being told by the only person who ever really mattered to me, besides my wonderful children, that I was loved makes my life not just worth living, but for me, it makes it outrageously magnificent. I'm by nature a sentimental person, if not an absolute Pollyanna about most things. I run the risk every time I post of not going overboard when it comes to her. Yet she's the sole reason I'm here. The only reason I know how to express love, she is the center of my life. Though ill and facing so many challenges, her power to love is undiminished. Happy anniversary, my dearest. Now, as Ben told it, there was a lot that he had in common with Len. He mentioned how much attention he paid to getting her in the back seat of their Dodge. I don't know if you have Dodges in the UK, <clears throat> a model car. The effort and the attention he paid to getting her positioned just so in the back seat of the Dodge so that he could lay the pizza box out, get to the pizza, easily get it to her to bite and eat but great attention paid to positioning and her sitting upright. He always described the pizza. It, when you would listen to him talking about helping her eat the pizza, you'd, you would listen to him and you'd say, okay, 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 Ben, it's a pizza, as he would say, and it has like two kinds of cheese and One's gooier than the next. All of which, not only would he tell you in the telling of his story, but he would also explain and describe to Rosemary as he helped her eat it. <clears throat> he would spend great attention to how he opened the 
ice cream box. It's one of those ones with the little tab on the cover and you peel it off. He'd describe that as he would tell the story and how he would describe it to her. And then when they finished, he would kind of review it. Okay, Rose, maybe we've now had ice cream. We had the pizza. I had two pieces. You had a single piece. We've got five left. We'll take it back to the nursing home and share it with the staff. Tell them it's our 26th wedding anniversary. Always talking, always describing what was going on. Always slowly, one thing at a time. Always slowly, one thing at a time, and waiting for her to respond to him in some way, not leaving her behind. It could have been something he read in her eyes, something that is not observable maybe to anybody but the two of them in their intimacy and in their long history together, reading their eyes or just a facial expression, a nod, whatever it is. But he would never get out ahead of her. He would wait step by step for her to respond. Maybe the smile was invisible, if you will. But you can begin to read those things of people as you get to know them over so many years. So if you take Ken and Len's shared experience, they were essentially doing the same thing, just like you are. When I say this is your story, it is. It's not just something I'm saying, man. This is true. <clears throat> what they were trying to do was just <clears throat> keep, in this case, their wives, is involved in the day-to-day -day life of their family as they could, to keep, to keep each other involved in each other's lives in those kind of endearing moments. And, sorry, another alarm I forgot to set off. I think that's all of them. Uh, to keep them connected as they always had been, to continue to share those moments together, uh, not only between them, but then they can report these things back to relatives or children and say what went on with their loved one. That counts too. The ripple effect of those endearing moments as you can retell them. Just from these stories, at least I saw that for all the challenges that HD can throw at you, these warm moments between people, these moments of endearment can survive, can last, can endure through all the challenges of HD. Maybe not consistently, but still they can endure. And that's an important lesson, I think, for us who take care of people, in your case, love people with HD. There is hope. However, to speak realistically, that hope can often be hidden. You may sense, these are feelings I'm talking about now, you may sense you're just not connecting with your loved one as you have in the past. You may be feeling that you're, quote, losing them. I'm losing him. I'm not reaching him like I used to. You may fear that he doesn't understand you. Again, that you're, quote, the metaphor is that you're losing him or the reality. Especially true if, for example, he's very apathetic and he's disinterested in stuff stuff he was passionate about before, as you try to keep it engaged. It's hidden, that hope is hidden among all these things. All these things feel like loss. They are lost, but they certainly feel like it, loss. And they can feel, in some cases, depending on the nature of HD's manifestation and the one you love and how you feel these things, it can even feel like despair. It's that hard, that challenging. <clears throat> when you feel those feelings though, you also know a couple of things. <clears throat> so there's the, 
the spiritual, uh, psychological piece of those feelings, but there's also what you, you know is fact. You know pretty much that your loved one has their hands full with struggling with their physical disability and all those cognitive challenges that we've talked about. And you know that everything he or she used to do automatically now takes much greater effort to do. And you know that as they interact with you and they think along with you, that just organizing their thoughts, just formulating what they want to say, which was done automatically in the past, they now have to think about it. And it takes great, great effort. So there's the feelings and coupled with what you know to be true. And it brings you to feeling that this is just another kind of a resignation. This is just another frustrating, exhausting moment on his end or her end to make himself understood to me. And despite my best efforts to keep him connected, engaged, he may be, and how I feel, he may be struggling just to share this moment with me, as discouraged as I can be. So what can we tell people at that moment? What can we share with them from others who've walked the road before and kept people engaged? How can we reassure them and maybe help them keep those endearing moments alive? How can we make them last? How can we make them endure all the challenges that HD throws their way? That's what we're gonna talk about now. So let me share the screen again. And we leave Ben. And we quickly look at very briefly some of the challenges and thinking, the things we covered last week. Now there's a lot of child cognitive challenges and thinking, cognitive deficits. I like challenges and thinking. You think slower, progressively slower, we pretty much can guess. In terms of memory, it's not a primary memory disease like Alzheimer's, but recognizing something is easier than recalling it. It gets more difficult to multitask and do two things at once. Hence, Ben's breaking down detail by detail, one at a time, of something as simple as a pizza. As they have all this stuff going on in the head, the challenges of thinking, it's easy to get distracted. As I said, it's difficult to switch topics, staying focused one thing at a time. And as we talked about before, it's difficult to organize, plan, and sequence. Those are the things we're talking about that people face with. We talked a bit again a couple of weeks ago about how it feels that way, what, what it feels like to think that way. So what are some simple ways that we can do to accommodate those cognitive challenges? We can't fix them. What can we do to accommodate them? And these are the things we talked about. And again, I warn you, I know how simple they are and they can be insulting as if we didn't know this. I know you know this, but some of the only ways we can accommodate people until science gets us a cure, an effective treatment, the therapy, whatever it is, I'm sure you take any one of them. <clears throat> All we can do is do things like go slower, do one thing at a time, no multitasking continuously reassure the person you're interacting with. Some things, some ways of reassuring people are so simple. They're done in everyday life. Three quick examples are this notion of preview and review. Now, if you've ever given a talk at school or at work, you might have told somebody and they said, yeah, I'll tell you how to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. Tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them and then tell them what you told them, summarize. That's what this is. Okay, Rosemary, I've got the pizza. I'm gonna have a slice, you have a slice. There's two, I'll help you through this. 
and you begin. And you, I'm repeating myself. I just realized I'm repeating myself. And at the end, you review it as uh, Ben did. But anyway, another way is play by play, just like somebody calling a football game or baseball game in our country. The announcer says everything that's going on, every player does. <clears throat> you can do the same thing. Okay, let's get you up in a good position here. Get that elbow, in, whatever it is, whatever you're doing, acting upon somebody, describe it. Do it slowly, but describe it. And milestones. Milestones are simply like a horse race. And they're off. They're coming around the quarter pole, coming into the back stretch, and then the three-quarter marker and home to the finish. In other words, if you're halfway done something, say, gee, halfway done. We're almost there. And when you finish something, be discreet. Okay, Rosemary, we finished that slice. Would you like another one? Again, insultingly simple, but incredibly important because it reassures that person who every moment is struggling with these cognitive deficits. Clear beginning and end. And if you do anything with folks to keep them engaged more than once, learn from Len and Bobby in the bed, talking about their kids. Ken would, when he spoke about their kids with her, after he had massaged her and he would lay there with that one cheek on the bed, he would review his day at the shop. He worked nearby and he would say who came into the shop and what was going on with the employees. Then he would go to their three adult children, name each one, right? One after the other in order of birth and uh, say, well, you know, uh, I talked to John today and Frank came by the store and, and Beth, I didn't hear from Beth today. Spoke to her yesterday, uh, I'll probably hear from her tomorrow, reviewing what's going on in their kids' lives <clears throat> and then would go through in order the same order every day. So oldest to youngest, in, this, in his case, his seven grandchildren, updating her on what was going on in their life. So-and-so had a football game and they lost, but they scored a goal or so-and-so got recognized as in one of the classes they were in, whatever it was that was going on in their life. He always not only gave the massage and the tuck her in, kiss her on the cheek, good night, see you tomorrow, and there was a sameness, a same order, same sequence of how he would talk about his family. So those are profoundly simple. But again, with all of the cognitive challenges, physical disabilities, it can be really, really difficult. But these endearing moments will endure, as we've seen. They will endure if we take them on on HD's terms. Endearing moments will endure, will last, if we do it on HD's terms. What are HD's terms? Well, HD's terms, as I see it, are the same ones I just named. Go slower, one thing at a time, the continuous reassurance, all that stuff. That's the accommodations for these cognitive challenges that we need to do. We need to do it on HD's terms. So HD's terms become our terms of endearment. If we do it on HD's terms, it's more likely that we'll be able to maintain those moments, make them last, those moments of endearment. So HD's terms, this go slower stuff, are our terms of endearment. Hence the title of this talk. Now, I want to show you, uh, let me make sure I covered everything. Um, I want to show you uh, just some tips. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really sorry. Some tips that I've seen as people like Ken, I'm sorry, Len and Ben tell their stories and you've told your stories and as I've seen you live them, 
just a couple of important things that seem to be universal. No data on this, just anecdotally, but universal that you see. Let me show you how to apply some of these things to keep endearing moments. And we're gonna do it through a Mars bar. Now, a Mars bar in the United States is a Milky Way. Same thing, same company, Mars, but uh, we mark them as Milky Ways. <clears throat> so a Mars bar, and we're gonna use the Mars bar to, again, try to create more engaging opportunities for people who are well on their HD road to show that we can, against all odds, these moments can endure to try to continue to stay connected to our loved ones. We're gonna do it again on HD's terms or our terms of endearment. But before I show you this, I have to do two quick reviews of things. The first review is about positioning or posture. So if you look not at that PowerPoint on the screen, but my little image hopefully up on the screen, I'm talking about being this kind of position, poorly positioned, slouched versus upright. So I wanna talk about some fundamental quick through positioning principles. The first is symmetry. Symmetry is if you draw a midline vertically through your body, that it be match on both sides. We're gonna look at this better visually. That your shoulders and hips horizontally should be level. That if you are flexed, if you look at my image on the camera, if you are flexed, you should extend. Or if you're extended, you should flex. And that if possible, your hips, your elbows, I have armrests on this chair, and knees should be at 90 degrees. Now, these are general, above all, do no harm principles of positioning. There's another one though I'm not gonna mention, and that is head support. If you are trying to engage somebody <coughs> and their neck is flexed and their head is down and they're apathetic and they have all these cognitive challenges and you have difficulty engaging them and you know their world is closing in, there's no more vivid uh, example of how limited your world gets if you think of what somebody sees when their head is down. So I can't give you a general principle other than try to keep the head erect, get help from your physio. There's a bunch of different reasons for that. And there's a bunch of different adaptations, treatments and stuff for that. But again, the point is positioning. So visually, let me just show you some slides. <clears throat> Here's this woman, well positioned, upright. There's the symmetry. Left and right, pretty much both sides equal. There's her shoulders, they're level. There are her hips, pretty level. Now, this is extremely flexed. I said to her, get in a flex position, and she did the extreme, but it makes the point of if you're in flexion, extend them, get them out of flexion. And vice versa, if they're flexed, splayed all over the chair, Flex them, bring them in. And <clears throat> if you can get their hips, elbows, and ankles, knees at 90 degrees, you'll find that they are easily well positioned and more comfortable, more amenable to interacting. So that is a quick review of positioning principles because positioning in keeping people engaged is really, really important. One more quick review though, and that is how to help someone to eat. Because I think you'll find that a lot of endearing moments will be a lot like Ben's, sharing pizza, sharing ice cream, as you help people eat. <clears throat> so how do you help somebody eat? These again are universal. Above all, do no harm principles, 
consult your speech therapist, OT or physio for more detailed, better guidance, but some general ones, helping somebody eat on a touch a tap, their lower lip with a spoon, simply, and you can recognize this when you think of feeding an infant or of somebody else with a disability, wait, ah, there's the word wait, for them to open their mouth and then angle the spoon downward, no scrape on the spoon contents on the top of their mouth or their upper teeth. Then there it is, wait for them to close their mouth around the spoon, remove it gently, and then watch for them chewing and swallowing, taking a breath in between mouthfuls, if you will. It's that simple, above all, do no harm. I'll tell you why I'm going over this in a minute. Now, here's how I remember it. So let me stop my share. And how do I remember those steps? Well, here's how I remember them. And I, if you're at home alone, join me. We need some beat because I'm going to show you my mnemonic device for remembering the steps of helping somebody to eat. It's a wrap and it goes like this. To help me eat, stop with a tap, to open my mouth to spoon in the downward angle ever so slight, closes my mouth to help me bite. Remove the spoon with the gentlest ease. Observe me now, if you please. Chewing is the next step for me. Swallowing follows, usually. Breathe a great big sigh of relief. You did it, man, and with no grief. A bit of self-indulgence. I hope you don't mind or and or enjoyed it. But that's my simple mnemonic, my simple mnemonic device for how to remember um, the steps in eating. So here it is. Touch a tap. This gets self-evident, but you'll see why. Touch a tap the lower lip. Wait for them to wait for them. What was that word? Wait for them to open their mouth, angle the spoon downward, wait for them to close their mouth around it, remove the spoon gently, and then just look and wait for chewing, swallowing, breathing. That's all you need to know. Now, I like doing those two reviews. Not because I just like doing that, tell me, start with a tap, rap, which I do, but also because Reviewing that stuff and getting people to pay attention, it bring, it slows you down. If you pay attention to all those details, it just slows you down and better matches the frequency or the pace of the person who you love thinking with all of those challenges. So just reviewing them and being cognizant of them slows you down. And to keep people more engaged, again, the same thing, stay connected with them better because we're doing it on HD's terms. And HD's terms serve for our terms of endearment. So now I'll show you how you might want to approach this with the Mars bar. But first, I need to uh, say... that we need to find wonder, find wonder in something as simple as a Mars bar. Look at that Mars bar. It's chocolate, it's caramel, it's nougat. Think of what we can do with that Mars bar. We can unwrap it, not just tear it, not just rip it apart, but pull it apart. Unwrap it the way it's made to be wrapped along those seams. You can break it up. You can stretch the caramel. You can take a little piece of chocolate off of the caramel once it's broken up and just put it in your mouth and let it melt. Suddenly it's 1969, 72 again, I know. But that's what we want to do. We want to zero in on every dimension that we can find of this bar. 
you can melt it in the microwave. Give it five seconds in the microwave and take it out and you'll be able to take your finger and the chocolate will be almost melted and just put it in your mouth. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna find wonder in this thing and we're gonna sit somebody down and we're gonna do this Hershey bar, but we're gonna do it slow. We've got my friend here, well positioned, upright, and that, in that kind of kitchen chair. She's looking at me as I read the label. It's not just chocolate nougat and caramel, it's milk chocolate. Smooth nougat, says the label. Creamy caramel. Let's open this bar. Let's unwrap it slowly, the way it's meant to be, by pulling the ends apart. Let me get this describing everything I'm doing as I'm doing it, slowly. So pull open the wrapper, pull it down the seam. Ah, ah, there it is. I know you like Mars bars. This one is a maxi bar. It's got two halves. Let's put one half away for tomorrow. Let's work on this one half of the maxi bar. And let me break it open. Oh, yeah, there it is. You can see the chocolate and the nougat and the caramel. Break it open and let me stretch the caramel. Have fun with it because this hopefully is an endearing moment and fun is woven into the endearment. So stretch the caramel. I know you love caramel. Now, let's break a little piece of that chocolate off. There it is, as it floats on the nougat and caramel. Let me break a little piece of that off and put it in your mouth and let it melt. And that's the chocolate. Now, maybe we'll just get a little bit of that nougat. Let me get it with my finger. Not, not the chocolate, not the caramel. Let me just get nougat. I know you love nougat. Make a little ball of it. Let me put that in your mouth. Wait for you to close your mouth. Mmm. So we've had chocolate, nougat. Let's go for, how about just the caramel? Just the caramel. Let me get a glob of caramel here on my finger you'll notice, oh, I can see your mouth is open. I can see, I know you love caramel, man. And then I put it in your mouth. And again, because of choke risks and swallowing problems, I wait to make sure that you swallow and take a breath between swallows. Pause, slow, well-positioned eating principles. Now that one was in a kitchen chair. This now is in a living room. I just want to point this out because <clears throat> uh, living room furniture is harder to position people well. So here, here's this woman in um, a chair bent over and here she is extended more. Um, it's really hard the way easy chairs and nice furniture is designed to get people in a good position, but just simply do the best you can. It's hard, for example, it's hard to get their knees, at, uh, their hips at 90 degrees. It's hard to get their ankle at 90 degrees. <coughs> Basically by the nature of design of the chair, but the, I put this in to point that out. You can only do what you can only do. And until you can do better, general principle. Otherwise, that easy chair is the same as the other chair. It's all the same. And I want to say one more time, stretch that caramel farther or further and have fun because we're doing 
things that we want to last and endear one another and endear ourselves to one another with shared fun. It's all the same. It's all the same terms of endearment. Nothing fancy to it. But when you slow down and use those one thing at a time principles, calling attention to these things and get people properly positioned, it makes it easier for you as the carer. It makes it easier for you as the person living with HD. It's a better match cognitively. So I want to go from that to one more love story. It's another love story. And you know, I'm sure many of you know, Trish Dayton and her late husband, Steve. So she wrote in her book, uh, The Curse and Verse and Much More Worse, distributed by the HDA for a long time. I'm a fan of that book. Trish covers a lot of topics in, in about care in it and what it feels like for both the carer and the person who's living with HD. So there she is with her late husband, Steve. And by the way, she tells me when I ask permission to use this again today, that today actually would have been um, Steve and Trish's 32nd wedding anniversary. But anyway, Steve, I'm sorry, Trish wrote in the book this. He read the paper avidly, but as they owned the screw, his reading skills were fading fast, nothing they could do. But rather than admit defeat and take this pleasure away, she carried on regardless and bought the thing each day. Okay, she had to turn the page, his hands no longer able. And then she had to fold it right to fit his bedside table. From time to time, she'd read aloud, if struggling so she felt, the little looks of gratitude, her heart would simply melt. And again, that's one of the poems in Curse and Verse and Much More Worse by Trish. I call the reader, but I use that because it started out where she would be, arrange his world by getting the newspaper. And then as time wore on and Steve walked his HD road, she had to make more uh, adjustments and accommodations to folding it, sometimes reading aloud, struggling. But my point is, there's no simple thing. It's a, HD is a moving target. And what might start out as simple assistance can grow into moments of endearment that keep people connected to one another. So that's another love story, Trish and Steve. One more love story. It's called Know Then. And it's written by a guy named Leon Jaffe. He was from South Africa, I never met him. And he wrote it for his wife, Pitter, who was walking her HD road. If you've heard me speak, I very often end with this poem because it sums up what I try to convey to people. Well, he, he sums up really well. So here's the poem that he wrote about and for his wife. It's this. You surprise me every day, your fighting spirit, your vision and its ability to draw me forward with you, your loveliness as you plunge through the hardcore of the future. You achieve what others dare not even dream about. You know no barriers to the universe. You are my dreamer, my leader. With you, I am greater than myself. With you, my perpetual fear carried like a rock is turn to water to drain away through the tunnel of your laughter and courage. This day we face together another challenge. I hear too distant to do more than love you. I will myself to weakness 
that my strength may add to yours, I will myself to passivity, that your actions may shame and humble all like me. Know then how much I admire you, and much more than that, love you. Now, let me come back out of my screen here and say this. I want to talk about hope for a minute. <clears throat> People live with HD and one of the things as humans is they have hope. And people in the extended worldwide HD family, different people find it in different ways. Some people find it in following uh, scientific advances, especially now with all these drug towels following closely like they follow sports, their football teams. Other people find hope in a more active way by volunteering to be subject. And think of all those folks in my country, your country, uh, who are walking around with m having had multiple doses of these new hopeful uh, designer drugs that treat HD at its core, not just symptomatic treatments. But some people find hope more actively by saying, I'm in, being part of it. Then, as always, when faced with things, difficult things in our lives as humans, some people find hope in faith and in, 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 through prayer. So others find it in affiliation with others who are facing the same road, just like this affiliation through the HDA. Other people find it right in their own families, in their own extended families. I'm trying to offer you another type of hope that through these love stories and through the experiences of people who've walked their HD road alongside people that love them, they've shown us that no matter what HD throws your way, very often, not always, I'm not Pollyanna here either, but most often, warm, endearing moments will endure even in the most advanced years, the challenges HD throws in its way. And I think that's important to note, to give you hope as you continue to partner with the one you love as a carer, as somebody who's walking their HD road, that you can maintain warm, poignant, tender, endearing moments even in the most advanced years. And I also said, and I'm going to repeat it again, some of you right now may have no hope at all that you're going to be able to hold on. But as HD evolves, sometimes it's not a straight line. It's There are windows of opportunity where all the cognitive challenges collide and there are windows of opportunity, I don't know why, but people will tell you. I thought I would never be able to connect again like we had, but sticking with it and letting time go by, there are opportunities again. I wanna give you that hope. Even those, even those of you who doubt it now. So let me share my screen one more time and give you a few last lines from Trish. When I asked Trish to use this stuff, she pointed out that I should use this picture of her and Steve because it shows Steve farther down his HD road. And the lines uh, are just kind of a way I want to close. And they're taken from one, one of her poems, somewhat out of context, but she writes, but there's the one thing we will have forever. Our friends will one day come to see that we may not have grown old together, but our time was the best it could be. 
And that's all one can expect is making the best of it. Do your best until you can do better. But maybe your best is your best. And maybe your best is connecting. And there are many, many stories, as I've said, your stories, not Ben, not Len, not Trish, not Leon, but yours of how you've stayed connected, engaged with the person you love. And I believe there's great hope in that. And I think it's important to attend to. So that said, remember three quick things. If there's one cognitive adaptation that I leave you with, it's remember to slow down and go slow so that your behavior, your words match the slower thinking, which is slower for neural reasons with all the complicating factors of all those cognitive challenges. Go slow. The second one is this. To go back two weeks ago, sorry up and wait. Remember that none of this stuff is hard. And I have failed if I have tried, if you've read in what I say that this stuff is simple. I have failed. It's not. It's really, really difficult. It's difficult for the person who has HD and it's difficult for the one who loves them, who is trying to keep those warm, endearing moments alive to make them last, to let them endure everything HD throws at it. So remember that over the years to do this stuff, whether you have HD or you love somebody with HD, it's a profound act of love. Again, my family is not touched directly by HD. So I have more cred than you do. It is a profound act of love. It's really, really hard to do. And it falls in the domain of the heart. And the last thing is, remember this, a true love story never ends. And with that, I thank you. I go back to this screen and if you've made it this far with me, I'm really grateful. Uh, and we will go back to Ruth. <laughs>